Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're, I'm just gonna give another minute or two for attendees to trickle in, but we'll get started momentarily. Okay. Hello and welcome to this afternoon's corporate sponsored webinar. My name is Claire Weinzerl and I'm the communications manager at the Illinois Soybean Association. Please join me in thanking our corporate sponsor BASF for sponsoring our webinar today. If you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window and we'll get those answered following the presentation. We're also offering continuing education credits this afternoon in integrated pest management and crop management. If you are a CCA in attendance, please fill out the post event survey with your name and CCA number. The survey should automatically open into your browser window at the conclusion of the webinar, and the link will also be available in the follow up email. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Greg Urey and Nick Tinsley. Greg is the BASF seed agronomist in Illinois. He grew up in Southern Illinois on his family farm where they raised soybeans and corn, as well as cattle and hogs. He received his bachelor's degree in agronomy from Murray State University and his master's in agronomy from the University of Illinois. Greg has been a certified crop advisor since 1999. He's worked in various roles in the ag industry over the last 24 years, working with growers on implementing new practices to improve production in corn and beans. Nick Tinsley earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where the focus of his graduate research was on the management of economically important insect pests of corn and soybean. Since joining the private sector in 2016, his roles have focused on managing field research programs to develop new seed treatment fungicides, insecticides, nematicides, and plant health products. He currently serves as a seed treatment technical field representative for the Eastern Corn Belt for BASF. Today, Greg and Nick will be presenting It Starts with the Seed. There are many factors that influence soybean yields every year, some that we can control and some that are out of our control. Understanding how varieties react to facts that we control, placement and management can help us be more consistent from year to year when the weather doesn't go the way we want. We will learn more about how BASF is evaluating varieties to give more information to improve placement and management of varieties on your farm. Please join me in welcoming Greg and Nick. Thank you, Claire. Um, so as she said, my name is Greg Urey. I'm a Midwest uh, agronomist with BASF. And I want to start off by saying thank you for joining. Um, I think we have a lot, uh, a lot of good things to show here or talk about today, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So when we think about factors that that influence yield, we've had uh, multiple different meetings where we've we've discussed the importance of planting date, uh, row spacing, uh, fungicide, insecticide applications. We all know that weed control and fertility are, are extremely important if we're gonna maximize yield as well. Um, today, what we're gonna discuss is some of the things we're doing at BASF that, that really hones in on variety selection, thinking about um, placing varieties in the right position, as well as how do we start thinking differently about managing uh, the variety based on its personalities. Along with that, um, Nick Tinsley will be discussing uh, some of our seed treatment options that we have that really help uh, add extra value and help us be able to maximize the, the soybeans uh, yield potential um, throughout the year. So I just want to start off thinking about uh, factors that do have influence over yield. And, and I think we all realize that uh, the big one that, that is out of our control is weather. Um, every year we know that weather changes. But there are many factors that I think we can do a better job understanding how varieties interact and, uh, and react 
with uh, factors that we, we understand and, and know that aren't changing from year to year to really be able to help us hone in. When I look at maximizing variety performance, I really think it comes down to um, how do we do a better job understanding biotic factors or the way a variety interacts with biotic factors being diseases um, and different pathogens. Abiotic factors, um, that's really looking at how we have subfield environments, understanding that uh, there are many factors from soil types, organic matter, CEC, slope, um, that we can start thinking through. We know that uh, certain environments or certain soils will, will create different environments throughout the year. Uh, and then really diving into saying, okay, if a variety uh, has a certain personality, is there a better way that we can think through managing that variety? So let's start thinking about diseases. Um, you know, it's very important that we understand when we put a variety into a field, uh, the risk that we potentially have within that acre of disease and whether or not that variety uh, is going to be able to tolerate that stress, right? Um, and when we look at BASF in, in our Zatavo lineup, I think we take it to a, um, to a different extreme or a higher extreme to understand um, each individual variety uh, their strengths and weaknesses to be able to maximize the, the strength of that variety. Every, uh, every variety that we have within our uh, BASF lineup, we put through our pathology lab to really do an in, in-depth uh, lab assay with many, many different diseases and controlled environments, whether it's sudden death, um, we do phytophthora, uh, testing to see what, uh, what race-specific gene we, we have in that uh, in that variety, we do phytophthora testing to look at field tolerances. Um, many other diseases that uh, that are hard to test um, in a field environment because consistency of diseases may not be um, be as consistent and easy to get good data. So this helps us be able to get a really good basic understanding of variety tolerance to uh, to diseases, but we also um, take a, a great deal of pride in, in doing our on-farm field testing, whether it's at our own in-site or on-site uh, BASF locations, or in some cases we may uh, team up with uh, universities that have, have testing. So looking at white mold, uh, we have multiple, multiple locations across uh, the Midwest where we can test and evaluate varieties uh, tolerances to white mold uh, to help us be able to get a a better grasp of uh, of what varieties are going to fit fit that environment the best. Uh, maybe it's frog eye leaf spot if we're uh, if we're further south and and uh, have a have a heavier disease of frog eye leaf spot. Um, sudden death tolerances. We have multiple locations where we get pretty good uh, sudden death screenings to help help identify varieties that are going to give us better tolerances. Um, IDC I know is a big issue as we uh, as we move west and into some of our higher pH issues um, to be able to help uh, identify those varieties, as well as um, Phytophthora and overall just wet feet tolerance. What varieties are gonna be able to tolerate uh, wetter environments to be able to uh, continue to potentially maximize yields or which varieties may, uh, may be uh, uh, inhibited by that wet soil and really cause a negative impact. But these are things we try to do or we do um, before we ever sell it. I often say that uh, I don't want uh, I don't want us to be using our our customers' farms as our test strips. We should do a better job of understanding these varieties before we ever get them out on the farm. So that's kind of understanding that biotic factor and, and what we're doing differently there um, to be able to really hone in on on how a variety interacts. Uh, the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the things we're doing to understand the abiotic factor and uh, and how that interacts. So obviously, weather does have an influence over yield every year. Uh, we can't change that, but we know that um, within farms, within fields, there are multiple different uh, uh, subfield environments. And how do we do a better job understanding that subfield environment and how that impacts or uh, affects varieties. So you think about um, in your field, the impact that organic matter or CEC has, you know, higher organic matter soils have um, probably better soil tilt, better water holding capacity, 
um, allowing for that plant to be able to have a better chance to have access to soil moisture uh, throughout the so the season. Uh, slope, uh, if I'm on a uh, soil or a uh, soil that has a, a zero to one percent slope, um, I'm going to be able to maintain the water that falls on that versus a, a field that has maybe a, a four to six percent slope. You know, the 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 rain that falls on that acre, um, some of it's going to soak in, but some of it's going to continue to move down uh, through through uh, gravity to that lower acre. And how does all how do all of those factors play into understanding soil water and availability? And then how do the varieties individually, uh, different personality of varieties interact with that? So we started looking at doing testing uh, differently than what we had in the past. Uh, historically, we've done small strip trials, maybe 500 feet long. Uh, with these trials, what we're doing is we're looking for, for fields that um, go all the way through the field. Uh, half mile long fields or rows, um, full planter width, full combine width, and, and really trying to identify the acre that has the variability. Uh, through that, what it allows us to do is help better understand and how we manage against the at-risk acre. When I say the at-risk acre, um, again, historically, our, our plots have been on some of the more uh, uniform, uh, better drained acres. These are looking at, uh, we're able to identify those saturated environments, those wetter acres um, that could have potentially caused more issues from that wet feet standpoint, as well as in the same, um, same plot have acres that are water limited and those super dry acres that um, that can create some uh, the droughty uh, situations as well. So it starts with uh, understanding the environment that we have within these uh, within these trials, understanding which uh, where we can start ident uh, evaluating plots or the varieties throughout the season. And then we isolate the mechanism. And when we talk about mechanism, that's, that's uh, a fairly new term or way of looking at soybeans uh, from what we've had in the past. Uh, but it's something that we're probably all fairly familiar with when we talk about corn and really thinking through how is that plant partitioning yield. Um, what we've noticed is there are plants that tend to want to have more main stem yield, um, probably aren't going to be able to put as much branch yield on. Uh, what we've seen out of those varieties, they, they tend to be very stable varieties, um, have the ability to go across a lot more transitional acres and, uh, and be very, very consistent from field to field and year to year. Uh, a couple things that maybe uh, are at risk with those, those uh, varieties are if we are in that super highly productive acre and we get everything going right, it may not have the uh, quite the ability to put on that super high top end yield, um, but very, very stable across a lot of environments versus a high VPI product that uh, we see wants to actually put a lot more branch yield on. These are the ones that when you go out and, and you look at it in low populations, look like there may be uh, potentially three plants worth of, uh, of yield on one plant with all the branching. Um, where we see these variety strengths are in those highly productive acres, those acres that um, less slope, uh, higher organic matter, um, areas that really promote growth. And that's where these tend to uh, be able to have the, the most uh, success. Uh, some of the risk we have with these varieties though are uh, when we start getting into that water limited acre and uh, drying out the branch yield um, can actually act as a, um, a negative component to here. Uh, as, the, as the plant uh, starts having less water available to the plant, uh, some of the first yield that we start aborting is that branch, are the branches. Uh, we see that they, um, they are the first ones to go. So as we get into that drier acre, um, thinking differently about uh, how we maybe manage this or trying to maybe keep this on the more productive acre seems to um, have a, a better success for this variety. So with that being said, uh, that's what we call our variety profile index. Uh, we, we've gone out and we've classified and characterized um, or quantified the varieties based on their ability to um, really branch out and where they want to put yield at. And what this has allowed us to do is help uh, 
really think about um, guiding our placement decisions as well as guiding us in maybe how we start thinking differently of managing individual varieties. But you can see that there are multiple varieties that, that are above the, the average line, um, more of the high VPI products, uh, as well as we have uh, several products that are below that, that tend to be more main stem. Um, but this is a good characteristic of our good guideline to maybe where, uh, what the strengths and weaknesses are, what the potential risk are behind individual varieties. So as we have gone through uh, and done the done the testing, this is just a, a picture of one of the locations that we uh, that we used. Um, again, half mile throughs, uh, full planter with full uh, combine head width uh, long, and you can see that acre A is in that uh, back end of the field. It's at the bottom of the hill. So this is a extremely saturated acre that we were able to um, evaluate through the year. Uh, that's where we do all of our uh, infield evaluations, looking at different uh, growth, uh, growth of different varieties, how they all compare against each other in that saturated acre, as well as acre B um, being more on top of the hill, that dry, uh, drier environment, and being able to really look at um, how varieties are comparing against each other in uh, in that environment. So, what that's allowed us to do is is really think differently about how we um, position varieties, but also how we, uh, what varieties, what types of varieties we wanna have in our, in our portfolio. Um, in the past, when we have done testing on strip trials and we have two varieties that are similar maturities, um, for, for instance here, I'm using 3651 and 3752. Um, overall, 3651 showed about a half bushel yield advantage over 3752 in all of these trials. In the past, we might say, well, 3651 is the variety that we wanna keep. Uh, we really don't need 3752 if it's not bringing an advantage um, over 3651. But then we start looking, we say, okay, they're really not even the same type of varieties. They're not really competing against each other for that same placement. Um, how do we start looking at them differently? Through our testing, and uh, when we started getting yield in, we started seeing that there's clear um, areas that that one variety favors versus another. So what we're looking at here are green arrows are uh, showing where 3651 had an advantage over 3752. So if you think about, look at it in slope. So the flatter, um, flatter slope, less slope, or water's not running away from, uh, the plant had more available water, actually favored the 3651, that environment that promoted growth. Um, but as we start getting into more slope, we see that uh, 3752 um, has a pretty significant advantage over 3651. Organic matter, uh, higher organic matter acres um, tend to favor that high VPI product like 3651, and that's what we saw here as well, uh, versus the lower VPI um, products in that lower organic matter acre um, having a bigger advantage. So. What this has allowed us to do is think differently about varieties, uh, variety placement. Uh, we're able to see first year out of the gate when we bring them, bring a variety out, um, a lot more confidence of where we place them, um, how they might interact within that subfield environment to be able to help uh, maximize consistency from year to year and maybe less of uh, influence of, of weather over uh, over placement or over the uh, performance. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is something we've spent several, uh, spent quite a bit of time on this year looking at is grower management. Like I said, we're looking at varieties and understanding that they have different personalities. So what I wanted to do was say, okay, with different personalities, is there something different we need to do when we think about managing individual varieties? So we set up a lot of, uh, trials to really think about high VPI products versus low VPI products um, at different populations. Uh, we used 100, 140, and 180,000 at multiple sites. Uh, some of these fields were, um, or some of these trials were done with uh, full field strips like we did the uh, with the VPI trials, uh, where we're able to go in and, and really separate out by subfield environment. 
Um, we have multiple trials that we uh, that we've established on different uh, research farms. Um, some of them being strip trials, some of them being uh, small plot replicated trials. But there's a lot of data that we've been able to generate to start looking at and thinking through how does the um, personality, uh, how does the VPI of a variety um, influence the way we should think about population when we get into certain certain management uh, or certain environments. So I'm going to start off with saying, okay, overall, uh, what was our response to planting population by variety? And this is looking at um, a lot of a lot of locations, thinking through um, just on average, what did we see? And 3651, we'll look at that one. What we saw was at 100,000 um, versus 3651 uh, at 140 and 180, we gave up about a half a bushel um, by going 100,000. The 140, uh, the 140,000 rate seemed to be uh, right at average, and 180,000 seemed to be uh, the highest yield in this in these trials when we brought all of them in and we averaged them together. Versus 3752. When we looked at that, we saw that um, if we went to 100,000, we actually gave up about a bushel and a half versus 140,000 being about 1.2 bushel um, above average and the 180 being just slightly above average as well. So that's looking at the variety saying, okay, over all of our locations, uh, what was the best population? But that may not be the best way to look at uh, varieties when we understand and we start thinking about their personality um, to the subfield environment. So I wanted to go in and break out, okay, 3651, we know is a high VPI product, um, wants to put a lot of branch yield on. How did it interact in what we call a high VPI environment? So a high VPI environment would be an environment that, that really wants to promote growth, a higher organic matter soil, higher CDC, uh, water's not a limiting factor. Um, a lot of times, if you think about on farm, these are the acres where you get a lot of that growth, uh, maybe too much vegetative growth in some cases, uh, lodging occurs. What we saw was a product like 3651, a high VPI product in that environment, actually preferred to have a lower population. Uh, we see a pretty consistent trend that if we overpopulate it, uh, it actually costs us bushels. Um, in this trial and the trials we have, and and I will say that we're gonna to continue to do this. Um, we wanna have more data uh, to be able to back what we're saying, but in these trials that we saw all this year, uh, we saw about a three bushel advantage over average when we've dropped populations down to that 100,000 with 3651 in a high VPI environment. On the flip side of that though, this same variety when we get into what is considered more of a low VPI environment, an environment that is dry um, and, and really uh, is not able to support or provide the plant with as much water as it needs to be able to fill, we see that that low population that was advantageous in the high VPI environment can be a, a pretty big negative when we get into that low VPM, low, low VPI environment, where actually the higher populations um, are showing a, a pretty uh, significant yield advantage over the low population. And some of the things I think we're seeing there are the reasons, if you remember back, we talked about strengths of uh, high VPI products uh, versus low VPI products. And what's the weakness of a high VPI product is when we get into that dry environment, if we're relying on a lot of branch yield, um, that's a detriment to yield because that's the first place we're going to start aborting. As we uh, push populations higher, we actually kind of manipulate that product to be a little bit more of a low VPI product to be able to tolerate those uh, drier environments. We look at a 3752 um, by environment, a lower VPI product, um, a slight yield advantage in the high VPI environment to uh, a lower population, but less than one bushel above average in that. So probably not st statistically significant. Um, some of that could be from lodging, um, being able to have less uh, less lodging issues, resulting in the uh, lower population being slightly better. But when we start looking at the uh, 
the low BPI environment or that drier environment, we see a similar trend um, as far as pushing populations too low in that environment, we can have a negative yield impact, but we don't need to go quite as high or it doesn't appear that we need to go quite as high with a low BPI product in that low BPI environment because we've already established a plant that is um, more stable on that dry, dry environment with a low BPI uh, variety. So um, kind of want to summarize what we've looked at and maybe under, try to understand some of the, the differences uh, that I'm thinking through as we talk about the personality, the BPI of the variety, um, being able to place it in the right place and understanding management of it. But if you look at the, uh, the difference between 3651 and 3752 in the high BPI environment, you can see a pretty, uh, pretty big yield advantage um, to go into a lower population with 3651 where it's not as evident or not as uh, dramatic as, uh, as it is with 3752, um, but we can take a bigger yield hit if we overpopulate uh, with a high BPI product like 3651. So 3752, uh, we talked about low BPI products being uh, fairly stable by environment. It seems like they're probably a little bit more stable by population too, and probably not as impacted as much. We get into a low VPI environment um, and we have a high VPI product, we really see that maybe putting more plants out there uh, brings a value due to the fact that we can kind of manipulate that plant to want to put more main stem yield on and be, uh, be a little bit more stable in that environment. So I do believe that as we continue to go forward with our testing, um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to um, be able to capture more bushels. Uh, by being able to better understand placement of varieties, as well as understanding how we manage individual varieties uh, within certain subfield environments to maximize their potential. I'm going to turn it over to Nick and let him talk about some of the seed treatment options that we have to help maximize yields. Sure, thanks, Greg. And, and just to confirm, Greg, can you hear me right now? I can. Great, and so I've requested control, so I think I can uh, advance slides from my end now. So um, thanks for joining here today. My name's uh, Nick Tinsley. Um, like it was said at the top of the lineup, uh, I'm the seed treatment technical representative for uh, Eastern Corn Belt, which of course includes Illinois. I'm, a, I'm an Illinois native, I live in Champaign. And so it's my pleasure to be here today to talk with you a little bit about some of the seed treatment options that BS has and BSF has to help kind of um, guarantee some of that yield potential that, that Greg's talking about. You know, uh, the yield potential is the highest when the seed is in the bag or in the box in the shed. And as soon as we throw it out into the field, that's when really um, the environment um, pathogens, insects can start to take a toll. And so um, I wanted to really highlight three products that BSF has in its lineup here today. Uh, these would be Olivo, Rolenia, and Vault IP+. And part of the reason I wanted to hone in on these seed treatment products is because no matter what base seed treatment you're using, um, no matter what company it comes from, these are three products that could be added to help supplement and provide extra control of, of some of those pathogens um, that are out there and, and help help really boost yield. So these are designed for the for the guys that are out there trying to push yields as high as they can. So first one I'll talk about is Olivo. And so you, you may be familiar with Olivo um, as an SDS product, um, but I want to kind of take a step back here. Oops, I'm, I'm not, uh, not advancing here. Great, oh, there we go. Yeah, so um, Olivo is typically thought of as a um, SDS product, but one of the nice things about it is that it has excellent activity against soybean cyst nematode, okay? So um, Olivo is a broad spectrum nematicide. And thinking about SCN, it's one of these pathogens that I think we probably need to talk a little bit more about. So um, what you're seeing here is a table. These are um, all of the pathologists from around the Midwest. Uh, once a year, they'll get together and they'll estimate how much yield loss goes on um, from the different pathogens and diseases that are out there affecting soybeans. And, and again, these are from 2018, but the reality is this table looks very similar 
Um, you know, if you were to go back all the way to 2011 or so when they started doing these, all the way up to today. And what's similar about that is that soybean cyst nematode always tops this list. That's not to say that other diseases aren't important. Of course, you know, you see frog eye leaf spot there causing 47 million bushels of yield loss every year. Um, and that column is measured in thousands. So um, it's higher than, than what you might think. But every year, soybean cyst nematode typically causes around 100 million bushels of yield loss. And when we think about commodity prices, uh, what they are today, we're talking about a billion and a half dollars as soybean growers are giving up the soybean cyst nematode every year. And so it's an important uh, pathogen to be uh, aware of. Okay, so, so where is this problem? Um, unfortunately, Illinois, uh, as well as Iowa, hold kind of this distinction as having found soybean cyst nematode in every single county where we've sampled it. So this is one of these pathogens that is not native to the US. It, it was discovered here um, in that kind of Southern uh, Mississippi River Valley in the 1950s. And since that time has really grown to kind of occur on every acre where you know, soybean is grown uh, with any consequence in the US. And you can see those counties in blue are new additions to the map. So every single year we do see more counties being added to this map. And so one of the things we've done at VSF is to try and help raise awareness around soybean cyst nematode by offering some free SCN sampling. And so each one of these dots here represents a sample that's been pulled from a field, sent into a lab and analyzed to find out the number of nematodes that are in these fields. And you can see that we've got quite a few samples. Um, we have done I think uh, somewhere close to 700 samples or so over the past two years. Um, samples that come back as dark red would be very high populations and samples that are kind of light gray would be um, none detected. Um, and so these are measured in the number of eggs for about a half a cup of soil, okay? And so you can see that that population can be quite high. Um, really, no matter where you are in the Corn Belt, there are going to be both high and low populations. And so this is an awareness campaign that, that we've been trying to get growers to um, take advantage of um, so that they can really understand the risk in their field. And I think the important thing to keep in mind is that when we look at all of these samples and we average them out, we come up with something like 2,791 eggs per half a cup of soil. And the economic threshold for this, it varies by state uh, in terms of recommendations, but it's typically around 500 eggs per half a cup of soil. And so most of these fields are coming back as having a population of nematodes that is going to cause some economic yield loss. And so this is surprising, I think, to growers, because one of the things that um, we think about with SCN, well, if it was such a problem, I'd see it. I would be able to recognize that I've got this problem. And I wanted to share with you this picture. This is the, a field in Northern Indiana. It's the worst soybean cyst nematode field I've ever been in. And so in this field, we had some of the classic signs and symptoms, things like stunting, um, even dying plants. And so when you look out in the middle of this field where you see that green healthy looking tissue, that's, those aren't soybeans, that's actually a part of the field where those soybean plants had died very early on and we get these weed flushes um, of, of, of weeds out there in the middle of the field. So very extreme situation. And so the problem is that this is not the typical SCN problem field. The typical SCN problem field looks a lot more like this. So this is a, a photograph of a soybean field taken in central Pike County, Illinois, very good soil. Um, no suspect, no suspicion that SCN was a problem in this area. The population in, the, in that field was close to 4,000 eggs per 100 cc's of soil. So there was certainly some yield loss going on there, but you can't really see it. And the reason for that is because, you know, SCN is causing yield loss by inducing pod abortion. And so those plants are, you know, they're healthy looking otherwise. Uh, they just have fewer pods. And, and that's very tough to see, especially driving down the road you know, 50 miles an hour. Um, of course, the action with SCN, it's all going on below ground. So this is a, a root system that was dug up. You can see on here, everywhere you see these small white um, globule shaped uh, things, those are the female cysts feeding on that root system. And so 
just to keep it in perspective, you can see how small this is, you know, with those fingers in the background. Every single one of those cysts is going to contain at some point around 250 to 400 eggs, which you can kind of see in that top right hand photo. So just looking at this photograph here, we're looking at thousands of cyst nematode eggs here attached to this plant. And so this is why uh, SCN can be a problem. And so with Olivo, um, one of the nice things about this is we know this is a sudden death syndrome product that's got very good activity, which we'll see here in a slide or two. But one of the things that's nice about it is that it's also a nematicide. In fact, it was originally developed as a nematicidal product um, sent to the United States for evaluation. Um, and so what we're essentially doing is protecting against nematodes as well as SDS in what we call the seed zone. So an area about the size of a softball right around where that seed is planted. So very from a very early stage, that soybean is, is going to be having protection against both of these um, pathogens. So from an SDS standpoint, um, you've probably seen photographs like this on Twitter. Um, I know a lot of folks have put out side-by-sides with Olivo in the past. In this particular field, which you can see is under center pivot irrigation, we've got a portion of the field treated with Olivo and a portion of the field that was just treated with a base uh, fungicidal seed treatment. And so you can really see the difference here um, in terms of the level of protection that Olivo is going to provide against sudden death. Now, you can, if you look at just the Olivo treated side, you'll notice that there is some sudden death in that, right? Nothing that we use from a seed treatment standpoint is going to be totally bulletproof. But definitely, this is a situation where this grower would have received a huge benefit from including Olivo compared to that area of field that did not have Olivo. So, going back a little bit to the SCN side of this, um, I want to share with you a couple results here of how we stack up against maybe some competitors in the marketplace. So one of those competitors that we often see is Saltro, which is a, a, a product that also claims SDS and SCN activity. So we challenged these two products, Olivo and Saltro, in a field where we know we had very high populations of nematodes. And so these are the results of that trial. Um, in the photograph on the left, what you can see is uh, on the left side of it, uh, a root treated with Olivo seed treatment, and on the right, a root treated with Saltro. And so it may be a little diff difficult to see on your screen, but everywhere there's a cyst on those two roots, there's a small white circle around it to help identify it. Now, certainly when you use a product like Olivo as seed treatment, there are going to be some cysts that you can see on those root systems, but there's not as many compared to that Saltro root that's not providing a lot of nematode activity. So what this translates to in, in that top right-hand graph, this is where we counted the number of soybean cyst nematode females on those root systems. That fungicide insecticidal base is just gonna be you know, a base treatment, no activity against either SCN or SDS. You can see when, when Saltra was used, we actually had a little bit of an increase in the amount of nematodes on those roots. And Olivo in this case is providing about a 60% reduction in the number of soybean cyst nematode females that we detected. But of course, we don't take roots to the grain elevator at the end of the year, we take yield. And so one of the things I, I wanna also point out is that bottom graph where we're looking at the yield benefits. So Olivo over that base treatment was gonna add about four bushels in this case, stemming from that nematode protection and about three bushels better than Saltro uh, because this field was a heavy nematode um, population. And so just looking at our on-farm results over the past couple of years that both of these products have been in the marketplace, you know, our, our long-term average with Olivo has been really excellent. So when we think about, on average, a grower who puts this out in their field, we typically expect around a 4.6 bushel yield benefit compared to just a base um, seed treatment package. Um, a level of consistency is another aspect of Olivo that's very strong about 84% of the time we're expecting a positive yield gain with Olivo. And this has been over a, a, a huge number, hundreds of comparisons over the years. And, and those go back to 2011. Since around 2019 or so, when we've had both Olivo and Saltro in the marketplace, we've been running these on-farm trials, which are typically split planters or split field type situations. If you look on the right, on that bottom right bar, Olivo versus the fungicidal base, Again, around a 4.9 bushel benefit. So that's, that ties in very well with what we've seen with our other work up top. 
And again, against Saltro on the left, we typically see about a bushel and a half or so benefit. And a lot of that is strictly coming from the fact that Alevo is a very strong um, nematicide component of it. So Alevo is definitely one of these products that if you're thinking about SCN, you're thinking about SDS, um, you know, it's important to have a, a strong product that's going against both of those. And Alevo can certainly um, fit that bill for folks. Okay, so the next product I wanted to highlight is kind of the new kid on the block from a BSF um, standpoint. And this is Rolania uh, fungicide. And so Rolania is not meant to replace a base fungicidal package. This is a single AI that can be added to a base fungicidal package to help enhance disease control um, from diseases like Fusarium and Rhizoctonia. So one of the things I wanna point out is this chart on the right. And so this chart is not something that's put together by BSF. This is something that's put together by the Crop Protection Network. And so this is a group of university pathologists that kind of gets together and rate different active ingredients and how well they perform on these different diseases listed across the top. Now, Rolania is not on this list because it's so new, we are still petitioning to have it added. But I do, what I wanna point out from this, if you look at that column, the fourth from the, the left, that Fusarium column, and you scroll down that, one of the things you're probably gonna notice is that there's not a lot of products on there ranked as excellent against Fusarium. And the same could also be said uh, that's true for Rhizoctonia as well. Now, the reason I point that out is because when we are in a situation where we've got a disease, where we don't have a lot of products that are either very good or excellent, it makes a lot of sense to add an additional mode of action to help enhance and extend control. And that's exactly what Rolania can do in terms of enhancing protection uh, on a base package against diseases like Fusarium and Rhizoctonia. So I put this out in a number of trials last year. One of those happened to be in Piatt County. Uh, we happen to have a BSF research farm there, which if you're ever invited to a field day there, I would highly recommend stopping by and, and, and checking it out. But this field typically doesn't have a lot of disease response. So, you know, seed treatment trials here are typically not very good. I was very pleasantly surprised last year when we had a trial comparing Rolania on top of a base on the right to just the base treatment. And when I visited this trial in, in kind of late June, I really to the row could pick out where Rolania was being used. And those plants appeared a little bit bushier, a little bit healthier above ground. Now, the reason for this is because when we think about seedling diseases, a lot of times what we're thinking about is stand loss. And that's certainly true. And Fusarium can cause stand loss. But one of the hallmarks of Fusarium pathogens is that they're root rots. And so a lot of times you might have a situation where you've got Fusarium growing on those root systems, but you don't have a lot of stand loss. And so you may not even be aware that there's a problem in that field. And so this is a situation where we probably had some Fusarium below ground on that root system uh, planted a little early, uh, which is a risk factor. Um, but on the Rolania side of things, when we added that additional mode of action, that third AI in this case, we really were able to knock off a lot of that root rot and result in a healthier plant above ground. So this is kind of what you'd see, and, and you wouldn't even notice that unless you had this kind of side-by-side -side out there. Okay, so what do we see in terms of, um, you know, yield benefit associated with Rolania? So there are really two ways to think about this. And so we've done a few hundred trials with Rolania over the past couple of years. If you think about these two graphs, the one on the left kind of represents the broad acre situation. So this, these are essentially all the trials where we've looked at Rolania on top of a base package and seen what that yield benefit has been. And in this case, we typically see on average, just kind of, you know, any given field, we would expect about 1.4 bushel acre advantage with Rolania. Now, this is statistically significant, even though it doesn't sound like a lot of bushels. This is, um, you know, we're able to separate that out. But it's really whenever disease shows up that Rolania has an excellent opportunity to shine. And so if you look at the, that graph on the right, these are all trials where we've um, inoculated with either Fusarium or Rhizoctonia. And essentially what we see when we look at those trials is that the yield benefit is closer to seven bushels 
associated with Rolania. And so that's really strong evidence that it's doing um, you know, what, we, what we know it to be doing, working on Pusarium, working on Rhizoctonia. Um, a nice side benefit of, of Rolania is that it's a very low use rate. It's 0 0.1 fluid ounces per unit. And so it goes on, doesn't add much to that seed treatment slurry. So there's a lot of, a lot of excellent opportunities to help not only get higher yield potential, but else, but help enhance disease protection with Rolania. Okay, so the last one that I kind of wanted to hit on here is Vault IP Plus. And so if you're like me, you subscribe to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, newsletters and news emails that come through. And one of the things I noticed, you know, a lot more than I used to is that they talk about biologic product or biologicals. And so, um, you know, I almost hear about these enough that it kind of makes me, uh, I get a little numb to it. And so when I think about soybeans and I think about biologics, one of the things I think about is kind of like the original biologic, right? It's that Brady rhizobium um, inoculant that soybeans need to be able to help um, get nitrogen, you know, from the soil. And so soybeans get about 60% of their nitrogen from rhizobia. And so it's definitely uh, using an inoculant like Vault IP Plus is really an excellent way to help ensure um, soybean nodulation um, goes as it should. Um, and the other nice thing about Vault IP Plus is that there are two other biologics in Vault IP Plus. So it's not just an inoculant. We also are adding two bacillus, uh, which are bacteria, uh, strains to this. And the, the unique thing about this compared to many other biologics in the marketplace is that these are living biologics that are colonizing the root system. And they're also EPA registered fungicides. And so it, instead of um, focusing on plant growth, BSF has taken the, the viewpoint here with uh, Vault IP Plus that it would be really great to add these um, biofungicides to the mix. And so we're enhancing protection against Rhizoctonia. We're enhancing protection against Fusarium. And when you think about controlling these different diseases um, with traditional chemistry like Rolania or some of these other products that you're using, you know, the, the amount of active ingredient is very high in that very early part of the season and then starts to fall off as those plants metabolize that product. Having these biofungicides colonize the root system means that they're going to extend protection and grow in the amount of protection they're providing into the growing season. So it's a nice way uh, to have a multiple mode of action that really extends in the growing season. Um, you know, from an inoculant standpoint, Vault is, is really quite excellent. These are photos from a trial I did last year um, in uh, near Sparta, Illinois. So this is more of a clay soil. Um, on the left, you can see just the base seed treatment without an inoculant. And on the right, you can see um, the number of nodules that we pick up when we use a product like Vault IP+. And so with soybean nodulation, really what we want are those pink, healthy nodules um, kind of right on that main stem. Those are going to be providing most of the nitrogen that that soybean plant needs. And you can really tell the difference here when you look along that main stem. And this is probably late vegetative stages. So uh, very excellent um, doing its job that it's supposed to be doing. From a yield standpoint, what do we typically expect with Vault IP Plus? Well, when you look at that graph on the right, that untreated check um, is kind of the status quo. So essentially, growing soybeans out in a field uh, where we're not using any kind of inoculant. Vault IP Plus is going to provide about three bushel advantage over that. And that's what our um, that's what our trials have done in the past. And you can see that Vault typically comes a little bit above some of those other inoculants that are out there. And that's because of those biofungicides that are also included in the mix. And so uh, Vault IP Plus represents a really excellent way to take advantage of uh, some of the, the trends that are going on in terms of using biologic products with a, a proven uh, rhizobia inoculant, as well as enhanced disease protection. And so um, with that said, those are kind of the three products that I wanted to highlight. And I, and I wanted to make sure that Greg and I wrapped up with enough time to answer any questions or discussion here at the end. But um, thank you all for, for joining on. And I think we'd be happy to, to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Nick and Greg. And as Nick said, please send any questions through that Q&A function or the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Nick, the first question I think is for you. It says, do you think that the drought conditions in June were the reason you were able to see disease differences in the Piatt County location last year? 
And will you see benefits in a quote unquote normal year with Rolenia? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, so we didn't do any formal disease uh, assessments in that Pyatt County plot. It was probably a little late for that. Uh, certainly anytime you get these uh, dry, con hot, dry conditions, I tend to think of rhizoctonia as being kind of an issue. And certainly that's one of the pathogens that Rolenia is picking up. In terms of in a quote unquote normal year, because I guess, you know, what is a normal year look like? Um, I think I tend to go back to that graph where we've got the 289 trials. So, you know, some of those, about 30 are going to be disease inoculated, but many of those are going to be put out under kind of normal broad acre type of search situations. And we typically, you know, on average, we see that 1.4 bushel acre benefit. I think there are probably situations where we might think it's a normal year and have a little bit more infection, especially with fusarium than we'd like to admit or that would be, be aware of. So great question. Thank you. Uh, next question. Is BASF including FCN resistant varieties in its portfolio that are not based on the PI88788? And what percentage of those varieties are coming from those sources? Yeah, so I, I would guess that's a question for me. Um, we do have a couple Peking uh, varieties in our lineup. Um, as the majority of the industry, uh, a lot of our varieties are coming from the PI-88788 uh, background. So um, I guess short question or short answer is uh, we do have a couple, but majority of them are in the PI-88788. Okay, next question. Mup what maturity are the Peking varieties? Yep, so we do have a uh, 2.9 maturity um, variety that, that we uh, tested last year. Uh, we are evaluating a new 3.2 maturity variety this, uh, this coming summer. I think there are a couple, um, or at least one or two in the, uh, the earlier maturities that are outside of my testing site. So I'm not 100% sure uh, what the variety is there, but um, the one that, that I tested last year was 2963. It's a 2.9 maturity. Okay, that's all the questions we have at this time. So if you have a question, please send it in. Um, but with that, Nick, uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to provide any closing final thoughts you have for us. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think um, we really appreciate the opportunity to kind of share some of what's been going on, some of the agronomic information and product information with all of you here uh, today. I know producing a soybean crop is, is, is not always the easiest. There's a lot that goes into it. And so, you know, if you've got other questions, um, I would just say feel free to, to reach back out to us or, or your local BSF representative, and we'll be happy to help get your questions answered. Okay, Greg, any final thoughts? I, I would echo that I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present and and, um, and talk to you. I, I think the key is understanding that um, every year is different, um, but there are there are things that we can do to maybe hedge our bets um, by understanding how varieties interact within um, certain attributes that we that we understand that we know are constant um, to be able to offset some of the risk when we have weather problems like we had last year. Um, pretty extreme droughts and uh, in, in certain areas of the state and uh, being able to get varieties um, in the right acre uh, definitely helped uh, minimize some of the impact that they had on, on yield. Okay, well with that, that's all the time we have today. I wanna to take another moment to thank Greg and Nick for their informative presentation today. And thank you to our corporate sponsor, BASF for sponsoring today's webinar. Please don't forget that if you are a CCA, please fill out your name and CCA number in the post event survey. But uh, with that, thank you all for tuning in and have a great day.